Okay, we got that <coughs> video started. Did you hit record? Hit record. Yeah, I did. Thank you, sir. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Everybody is fewer. Uh, very sick. And Luke is in Denver. So that's two that I know. Welcome back. Uh, and uh, um, it's a long week, and are we ready for some football? Does that start tonight? Yep. Who's playing? <laughs> It'll be almost over by the time class is out, so we can watch the fourth quarter maybe if there's something good on. Uh, tonight we are going to talk about uh, a few things. We, we had an assignment to look at uh, some videos on labor unions appropriately over Labor Day holiday. Uh, we uh, had a chance to maybe form some opinions, pros and cons, and I want to I want to hear your opinions, pros and cons. Uh, we may delay that uh, one more class. We've had a couple people that have had some uh, fights with Canvas, and uh, I don't want that to be uh, uh, a block. So hopefully, uh, I I did post all eight of the videos on YouTube, the under my name Steve Carwell, and they blocked four of them for copyright violations which is, stands to reason I got them off of YouTube, and <laughs> they're on YouTube, and so I'm not sure precisely what kind of money they think we're generating here by them by putting them up, but uh, they've got them on open, unrestricted uh, YouTube public domain, so I don't understand the violation, but there's an algorithm that looks for songs, music, whatever, so half of them are blocked. So half of them are up, and half of them are blocked. The re all of them are on Canvas. So you have a couple of ways of getting to those if you haven't had a chance to view. You don't have to view all eight of them. Uh, and uh, you, you just enough for you to do that and a little bit of research and form an opinion on labor unions because there are viable supportive and uh, uh, not supportive arguments. And I want us to delve into those a little bit as a group. Uh, we're going to talk, our topic for the day is organizational effectiveness from a HR point of view. Uh, how, how do we look at uh, an effective organization or a defective organization? We talked about dysfunctional management, dysfunctional leadership, and effective leadership is kind of the opposite of that, right? An effective organization is getting it done. And whether it's a little business or a giant business, the difference between an effective organization and a uh, crippled one is huge. We spot them instantly when a company is jacked up, when their policies are wrong, they're messed up, their people are hiring, that they're hiring don't fit my idea of a good customer service employee or whatever. Uh, we all make those judgments calls and, and we are going to dig into and look at organizational effectiveness and how we can work on an effective organization from the HR point of view in our selection of people and our, our talent development uh, that we do. And remember, I drew a kind of a timeline graph on the, the last part of last class, and I had over here on the left side the things we do to woo a new hire. You know, we, we, we uh, cast about in the public labor pool market trying, posting ads, putting, you know, uh, adding, adding incentives for referrals. Uh, we do all kinds of things to kind of recruit more people, especially when it's been like it has the last two years and we can't find people. We've had a labor shortage in our local market and that's been mirrored in the national market as well. Uh, the problem's a little different 
And, and by the way, just a side note on that, one of the solutions that's emerging from that in a way that we've never seen before is it has opened up the door to true distance employees, right? Employees that don't live near the corporate office. Employees that don't go to the corporate office for work. Employees that uh, have an office in their home and, uh, and they telecommute, right? And, and I've worked with organizations that did that. I've actually worked for organizations that did that and uh, a long time ago. And, 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 but now we're seeing, if we can't find the people we want locally, what is often happening now is they'll cast the net wide. We'll look in Seattle and say, you can live in Seattle and work in St. George. And that never happened before. And that opens up a whole new set of challenges if you're the boss. If you own the company, or if you're trying to develop the talent in the, the, the company. I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back to that for a second. But I talked about the recruiting process here, the interviewing process, the selection process for candidates that we want to work, the job offer process, the onboarding process, the training process that is involved now that they are employees of ours. And then we had kind of a little jagged unknown timeline, and then we talked about disengagement. We talked about when the employee wants a divorce, when the employee is done working in our company, they just can't take something that is there with the package. And we've all seen that. Some of us have experienced that, where we've, we've got to the point where we decided that we've got to, we've got to look for another job. And, and we talked about that process, and we looked at the article on the, from the book, The Seven uh, Re Hidden Reasons That Employees Leave. And that's about that disengagement process. And we, we learned that the very first flag that the boss usually can see is when the employee tries to change something. When they try to, they take a, they take a stab at changing something, maybe they do it well and within the structure of the organization. Maybe they do it maverick style and just do it. You know, different people have different, different approaches on that. In a good quality management system, if you're an ISO 9000 company, you have a process in place of how you change things. That, and, and you are in favor of continuous improvement, which means you always want to make things better, which involves change. But at the same time, you want to standardize things so it's repeated and done the same way every time. Those two things don't exist on the same page, right? Which, you, which do you want? You want, it, you want us to make things better, always? Or do you want us to standardize things and do it the same, always? You know, one's stuck in the mud and one is always changing and you never learn. And, and neither one of those is what we're trying to do. We're trying to do a blend of the both. We're trying to identify best practices dynamically and change all the time for better ways of doing things. But as soon as we change, we standardize that change until we figure out a better change. And, and we have a process that we put in place to do that in an ISO 9000 company. That process means the maverick at the front line does not have the authority to initiate a change and test it out and try it. That could wreck your company, right? You don't want that to necessarily happen. But you do want them to be entitled to mastermind something. Uh, I remember Milliken was a company that was here in St. George for a while. They're, they're an international company, a very large international company, lots of quality uh, men, the mentality in that company, mindsets of engineering, uh, and they say when they hire someone, they bring them on board and they say, uh, we didn't hire you to tell us how to make fabric. Uh, they make fabrics and materials and textiles. In their plant here in, in St. George, they made fireproof matting that went under, uh, inside the, a mattress. The mattress manufacturers would put it in there so if you went to sleep smoking a cigarette, it wouldn't start your bed on fire. Fireproof stuff. Uh, and that was their product. And they said, we didn't hire you to tell us how to do that. We know how to do that. We've been doing it for a long time. We know how to do what we do. We hired you to help us do it better. We want you to look at what we do and everybody at the front line to their engineering team. We want you to be part of uh, figuring out how we can do what we do 
better. So they had an improvement process. So the first sign we might see of somebody disengaging is when they try to improve something and they hit a wall. They can't improve it. We don't let them. We whack them for trying. We punish them in some way. We make fun of their idea. Ah, we tried that before. It doesn't work. Really you know, we, 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 we have these little ways of making sure people don't come up with another idea. And what that does is that, that confirms the disengagement, right? That confirms that they got to leave. That confirms that this is a dead end for them. And so we have the disengagement process that goes until somebody gets fired or they quit and, and they move on and then we're back over here. And what we decided was we, we spent a lot of time learning how to do that. We usually just react to this but we don't spend a lot of time here in that, that large space in the middle where we call that employee retention. What do we do to make our current employees want to keep being our current employees? What do we do? You know, what are we doing to make them happy where we're at? Companies like Facebook and Google are famous for the stuff that they do. They think that if they provide you oatmeal for breakfast, you will be a happy employee and you love working there. And I'm saying that facetiously. Things like that are small, little, what's a packet of instant oatmeal cost? Not much. But it works for certain people that they get to show up at their desk and put some hot water in that out of the hot water thing and eat a thing of oatmeal. Okay, if that's the kind of perk that your employees want, then you'd be an idiot not to do it. And so it's looking at ways that you can make employees love their jobs. A company here in town is Gun Company. They make, uh, they make precision competition rifles. And uh, one of their perks is uh, every day when things are going really well and once a week when things are backlogged and whatnot, they buy lunch for everybody. And they bring it in. And, and uh, it might be Jimmy John's, it might be something nicer, it might be whatever it is, they bring it to the office and they have lunch together as a family of employees at that company. And the, the feedback I've heard from that is pretty incredible. People that are underpaid at the jobs that they're doing love their work there, partly because they get lunch once a week. You're kidding me, you know? It really works. It really, it really helps unite them together as a family. And it's something that company does to help this employee retention in the middle. Because there's other places those employees can go. Their company's down in the Fort Pierce Industrial Park. Wilding Wall Beds would love to see you knock on their door and say, <laughs> we, we, we offer breakfast. <laughs> we, <laughs> do you really? Yeah. Okay. Sure. Well, that's awesome. The soda machine, we offer free coffee. We have to live at couches here. Sit and sleep on during your lunch break. We've got a dartboard. We've got uh, okay. ice pops when it gets hot. I'm, I'm loving it. But, but why are we doing those things? We're doing those things to send a token to our employees that, hey, we're people too. We like, you know, we like to kick back a little bit from time to time. We like to have some, some perks. And those things don't cost the company usually a ton of money. I mean, they do add up. They cost a lot. Paid out a thousand dollars in cash on Saturday for those that came in and worked extra hours. Wow! In cash, we paid them overtime and then we paid them cash on top of it. Nice, nice. That gets people um, happier, right? Yeah. It doesn't fix uh, uh, if we've got a problem. That uh, alone doesn't fix a problem, but it certainly makes people happier. So we talked about that, and and I want to I want to talk a little bit more. Uh, about this employee uh, retention thing today because engagement of employees is something I really want us to look at. Uh, I've got a series of video clips that are one minute long each so they don't talk to you in Denver. I told everybody you were in Denver. <laughs> uh, nice week. Nice, nice job. <laughs> Getting back. Um, we, we have... Um, the Gallup polls, we've talked about Gallup before. We've, uh, some of you have had a leadership class that I've taught. We've talked about Gallup quite a bit there. But I, there's a couple of things that I want to reiterate about Gallup's research. And we had a bunch of handouts last, uh, last class 
that had Gallup's name on them. And, and uh, we're going to review a couple of things from Gallup. I reprinted one of the uh, articles and that we're going to go through, and it's here with your handouts for today. And then there's two others that uh, are on the newer side that we want to talk about. But Gallup as an organization has done some things of looking at employee retention, looking at what is it that makes employees feel satisfied with their work, and they've studied it a lot, and they think that employee engagement is really important to us. The lack of employee engagement is kind of a reflection that they're somewhere in the disengagement process, right? They're either neutral, you know, just waiting for something to go wrong, or they are already planning at some point in time to change jobs, to change maybe maybe you know, companies and maybe places that you live. You know, people have uh, a lot of ways that they change jobs. You know, we, we, we have uh, people that want to change churches. And if they're in a geographical area that they're in a parish or a ward or a designated church that they have to go to in their particular religion, and there are many like that, not, not just the, the one you're thinking about. And to do that, if you want to change uh, church groups without changing religions, you have to move. You have to move into another space where you go to a different Catholic parish, for example. Uh, and uh, uh, you can't just pick and choose where you go. And so if you really want to move, you have to you have to really move towns. Well, people actually do that for jobs, too. They don't want to tell their current job that they hate them. So they move. And uh, part of the reason they move is because they just didn't know how to address quitting their job. And you, don't, you can't really quite believe that people would be, that would be true, but I've done thousands of exit interviews immediately after leaving a company and a year after leaving a company and longer for different different groups to try to figure out why employees leave. And the Department of Labor has given us some data on that. Employees, uh, 70 to 80 percent of employees that leave say they leave for more money. The real number is 12 and a half percent. Almost most of the people that leave don't leave for more money. Now, we all know examples where people did. So it, it can and does happen that people leave for more money. <laughs> We've got one sitting right here. Uh, it, and it's awesome when it happens like that. Being recruited and being offered more money is an amazing thing. But there are a lot of people that are disengaged. And when they're disengaged, they're at a disadvantage. And they're not in the driver's seat as much as they would like to be. Yes, Just to add to that, I think that the disengaged happen before more money. Uh, isn't that interesting that that helped stimulate that so it worked out really perfectly in the end but there was a disengagement there yeah I would agree with that okay. and, and, and that's 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 an interesting observation and and a lucky end to it <laughs> that you wind up saying dang I should have done this earlier you know kind of thing but the opportunity probably wouldn't have been that earlier it was just the timing it was right so the disengagement process is one that um, that we can kind of visualize it in our eyes, but if we've got a management team, we want to talk about it. We want to look at what is it in the organization that will allow better engagement. And I want to look at a few things that that uh, the Gallup organization has learned and is talking about. So I want to go into this document a little bit more, if you have your copy of it. We've, this is 56 pages total. We've read uh, the seven hidden reasons employees leave. And I want to come back to that. I've got two extra copies or one extra copy. If you don't have it, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll share that. The, the Gallup survey is called the Gallup Q12. And I want us to find the Gallup Q12. And 
this article right here. If you, I gave a copy to last class. I pre-printed it today. It's right here. So if you haven't picked one up, come get one. I want us to talk about that. The title of this is What is Employee Engagement and How Do You Improve It? And as this is 10 pages, there's 10 of us in the class, in the room, and, and I, I want us to, and there's a bunch of big ads. Uh, this is off of their web page. This is an advertisement of sorts for Gallup, and I want us to uh, kind of work our way through this document, and I'm going to talk about a few things that they say, and then we are going to look at their Q12 data and talk about it, how it may apply in our organization. So the title is, What is Employee Engagement and How Do You Improve It? The sections, there are 11 of them that we are going to look at, are a definition, why it's important, uh, whose job is it to keep employees engaged, what are the drivers that make employee engagement happen, um, why our current programs may not be working, how do we measure employee engagement based on Gallup's uh, uh, history and their knowledge, their, their research, uh, what is the model for employee engagement, uh, some examples, three ty types of employees that we have right now. Uh, what's the difference between employee engagement and the employee experience? Uh, how do we improve employee engagement, team uh, engagement ideas on improving it? And improving employee engagement begins here, which is the Gallup advertisement. Gallup is a national consulting organization. Uh, they have uh, a couple of clients that I know in St. George, I've worked with the Gallup organization uh, uh, cooperatively with some clients that they had. Um, they've done a lot in malls, which is an interesting thing because malls in America are in trouble, have been for a decade now. And the idea of making malls survive in a world of Amazon online uh, is a challenge. And, and so the Gallup organization has worked with mall owners uh, around the country, and I've worked with them on a few, the Fashion Mall in Las Vegas was one of the more interesting ones, where that mall is not indicative of all the rest of the malls in, in the world. It's not in a suburban area. It's right across from um, you know casinos that are highly profitable, and, and millions of people travel through, and, and they want to take home some stuff, and so some stupidly expensive watches, jewelry, uh, blouses, shoes are available right across the street, but this mall still struggles. And so in spite of the fact that there's a, a different market there, Gallup has had to work with that organization, and, and I've worked with that organization. Gallup has worked with the mall here in St. George, which is a completely different type of mall. This mall was, one third of the mall at one time was owned by Walmart, and Walmart doesn't actually own mall space anywhere in the, the world. That's not their game. But somehow, uh, they helped sponsor and build the mall in St. George, Utah. And some of you remember when Walmart was where Dillard's is. And when you see that little fenced-in area on the outside, on the end where you, by the gym that you go in and out of the property, uh, you, it looks weird. Dillard's doesn't need that space. Well, Walmart used it for their lawn and garden, right? And, and so when you look at it with that in mind, you go, oh yeah, that looks kind of like a lawn and garden department for a Walmart, and now you know why it's in our mall. And so eventually, uh, the mall was able to buy their space when they built a store, and uh, then, then that had, it's, then it still had two, two ownership uh, based on the investment group and, and a, a different team that bought that space. And at the same time, ZCMI, uh, decided that they weren't going to do business in Utah anymore, uh, and uh, they went under, right? And remember when that happened, they officially sold their assets to another uh, department store chain in Seattle, uh, at, but by the name of Nordstrom. And and uh, Nordstrom also decided to leave Utah just, just, just to add stuff to it because it's, it's a hard business to be in right now. And so Gallup has got experience with organizations like that that still have the challenges of, of trying to operate profitably and 
uh, trying to uh, engage employees and trying to engage, in their case, uh, uh, clients that are renting space from them and, and, and doing that. So Gallup has a lot of, of experience worldwide, especially in the U.S., and so we're going to look at some of the things that they publish here. I'm going to, we'll, we'll just, we'll kind of, um, uh, you're going to divide these up into sections, and you can each find your section uh, and, and read your section, and we'll talk, we'll go around and talk about it a little bit. Uh, Jake, section one, uh, Eric, two, uh, number three, number four, down to you, number five, number six, seven, eight, nine. And then I'll take 10 and 11. Uh, so if you haven't got one yet, get a copy and read your number. Uh, and then we'll talk about a little bit. I'm sorry? Mine says there's three kinds of employees. You have it, it only talks about one. And then it has an arrow where you could arrow over it. Uh oh. Mine says there's 12 elements and only has one. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah, we need to arrow over. I got a problem with that. You can't do that. See, that's why, that's why hard copy is no good, right? <laughs> All right, let's see if we can find that. So we can talk a little bit more about it. I know what the three types of employees are. Six. Mm -hmm. yeah, those are, that's the twelve questions. And yeah, more about well, I can see the question lines. We have those okay. elsewhere. You can share about leading up to that.
let's talk about what we do have there. I, I'm not, uh, at least they put me on the bing, and I don't, I don't know if it's been very well, you know, for some reason. Jake, what did you learn um, about the definition? So the, the definition, I, I learned that employee engagement helps measure When, when, when we are when we are personally engaged, what, what are some of the things it feels like? Because we've had our days where we're engaged. You feel like part of it, like part of the company, like it's like it's exciting to be part of what's happening, like an important part of it. Well, we, yeah, when we get in the groove, whatever it is, big or little, that we're doing when we're engaged. You know, an, an example of measure engagement is almost all of us have a, a different level of engagement the day before we leave for vacation. We've got a list of crap we got to get done. We've been delaying and we don't want to get caught that we didn't do it while we're gone. And so we got this list of stuff we check off that, man, we motor through. We are one efficient thing. We And, and whether it's we're engaged for the wrong reason. We're engaged because we're covering our butt. We're engaged because we're, you know, we're trying to get things whistled up so that, you know, everything will go smoothly when we're gone. That may be the wrong reason to be engaged, but nevertheless, the behavior is the same, right? We're engaged. We get it done that day. Somebody starts to talk to us, we don't have time. You know, we, we politely, you know, push them off in a different way and we get our stuff done and when you go back and look at your planner and the stuff you got done that day, you're amazed at yourself because you got you made it happen. And and that's true, you know, you do it at home too, you know, when you're getting ready to go camping, all that stuff that's on the list that you're going to forget, you somehow magically pull it all together because you're engaged. You are going to make it happen and it feels good. Uh, you feel on the edge of control like you're almost, I'm forgetting something, I don't want, you know, you're really, your brain is extra focused. You're you're sharper than you usually are. You're, you're getting more done, more, uh, you're wasting less movement, less time, less, you know, your inefficiencies uh, drop off. That's kind of what it's like to be engaged and engage people that way every day. They really make it happen. That's what they do. They, they come in and they're like a sword fighter. They don't know where the other person's going to swing next, but they're at it. And, you know, they, they've got it. And they're like an emergency room doctor. They don't know who's coming in next with what, but they're there, and they've got them, and they, you know, they, they're, they're ready to deal with that, and some of you feel like emergency room uh, uh, technicians <laughs> or doctors, you know, at work, it's you're putting fires out all day, you know, you don't even know when you go to work what the fire's all going to be, you've got a list of stuff that you want to get done, but you show up, and, and all this other stuff happens, but you're engaged, so you take it on, and, and even though it wasn't on your list of stuff to do, you you get it resolved and you make it happen. Those are good days. And that's employee engagement. We want that employee's uh, engagement more often than not, right? We want more often employees to be engaged. And, and Gallup's findings is, it'll come back when we get to section eight, that, that, that maybe, maybe a third of our workforce is engaged. And that's good and terrible. <laughs> you know, it's good that we got people that are engaged, and it's terrible that it's only 30%. Uh, but anyway, we'll talk more about that in a minute. Number two, Eric. Uh, number two, why is employee engagement important? Um, I don't know, I feel like that's pretty self-explanatory. I can think of, like, for example, like three people at my work. Everybody's always got those people that I guess, you know, it's always, you always catch them standing on their phone or something like that. And got some people coming in in the morning, and they'll just sit around. You know, those are always people that, you know, obviously get less stuff done and they're always 
trickles downhill because you know the people that are engaged they always have to you know in a way make up for the work they didn't get done you do. and that just doesn't make anybody happy yep so yeah the, the engaged people are stepping up for the people that aren't and and even if you are not actively disengaged you're just neutral yeah when you're just neutral you know you know exactly what will get you fired and you do just this much more than that, right? Yeah. You know, it's you're not going for top performance. You're just going not to get fired, you know. And so that's a big difference. And and so the engaged people aren't even paying attention usually to that. They are focused, nose to the grindstone, getting it happen, making it done. And why is it important? You said it's self-evident. I think that's really true. We 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 are going to benefit more from employee engagement. And why settle? for two out of three players on your team not being engaged. Why so? Now, we, we see football teams are that way. We're gonna, the season's just starting tonight, and we're gonna see players that aren't engaged, as the season, especially as the season goes on. They'll be more engaged today, right? Uh, because just starting, you know, they haven't screwed up yet, they're not hurt yet, all that stuff. But at some point in time, they'll see somebody sign a new contract for a billion dollars and they're going to get disengaged because they think that should have been them. And, you know, they, you know, how come he's making so much more money than I'm making? And I'm taking hits and blah, blah, blah. You'll, you'll see and hear the agents talking about it. Uh, Alyssa, what did you do in number three? What did you learn? Um, that it's the manager's job to make sure that people are engaged and that they're not just sort of there to be engaged. Let's, because uh, the, the question was, Whose job is it to yeah. get people engaged? Mm -hmm. And you're saying it's the manager's job. Manager. Possibly to have a lot of review. So, so it's not necessarily just the owner, right? It's the people directly around uh, the employees. I want to back up for a second because I almost skipped it. Uh, on this stuff that's hard to read, like maybe that's all of it, but, but, but on what Eric reported, um, there's a bunch of data here on what they they found in companies that had they, they they looked at top quartile and bottom quartile companies that they dealt with that means the top 25 percent and the bottom 25 percent in performance of the company and they deal with all kinds of companies ones that are in trouble and ones that aren't and in the in the the difference between engagement um, the top companies have more people engaged, bottom companies have fewer people engaged, right? It correlates directly to company performance. A factor like absenteeism, the bottom quartile had 81% more absenteeism than the top quartile did. Engaged people don't call in sick. Engaged people show up even when they're feeling a little bit, you know, like they'd rather take the day off. They're engaged, they, they show up anyway. And so absentee, eight, an 81% difference in absenteeism, is that's, that's not small of what you found. Safety in, in incidents in, in deaths and falls were the two that they looked at. 58% fewer deaths and falls in the companies with more engaged people. Um, less turnover by almost 20%. Uh, in the high turnover organizations because people are going to quit anyway uh, in high turnover because it's really known to be crappy work. You know, take certain jobs like castrating pigs at Milford Pig Farm. That's a bad job. And, and so there's high turnover in that job. It, you got to drive all the way to, my, to, to you know, where, yeah, it's, yeah, you got to drive, drive, and drive, and tear up your car, uh, driving it. Uh, just to get to work, and then when you get to work, you don't get paid a lot, and you're doing a smelly job, uh, a messy smelly job all day long. That's not necessarily what would be on your list. Of, that's a high turnover type of a job, right? Uh, and even in those kinds of jobs, they have 20%, almost 20% less turnover. In the low turnover jobs, 43% uh, less turnover. Uh, they steal 28% less stuff from you. That's kind of interesting. Uh, 64% less safety all uh, aggregate. Uh, uh, fewer defects being made, uh, more uh, customer loyalty, more engagement. The customers notice 
when the employees are engaged. Uh, uh, productivity up in terms of top line sales, profitability up by 23%. And, and if, if that 23% difference in profitability can set your company aside from your competition, that's how you work. Uh, if you're more profitable, then you've got more room to do that. So uh, that that's was from item number two. We're at item number three, and I think you covered that. Uh, the leaders have got to understand that they have to step up and they have to be uh, responsible for employee engagement. So that's that. Uh, uh, Callie, number four. Um, it says, what are the drivers of employee engagement? Um, it kind of explains how a lot of companies tend to shower their employees and like extra food, extra Butter you up and bought it. Yeah, yeah, right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. right. And and you know when we look at error in surveying, you know there's a lot of error in surveying. Gallup is a survey company first. That's what they started out as. They really get the error in surveying. There's bias. Uh, there's people that are completely content and happy and don't want to say anything about it because everything's fine. They expected that. It's not spectacular. Uh, to them, and then there are people that their hair's on fire, and all they're going to do is go and yelp and go boom, 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 you know, giving bad reviews and deducting stars and, you know, writing in and doing all kinds of stuff, you know, they're very vocal and whatnot. So employee surveys are very tough. So you give them cupcakes the morning of, you happen to give them a survey. Is there bias in that survey? Yeah. Yeah, of course there's bias. And so we tend to call, we meaning, you know, me, <laughs> uh, tend to call, uh, those kinds of surveys, smile sheets. The, you know, it's you know that's all you're going to get. It's not going to be of huge value. <coughs> we, it is important to try to gather information. I'm not opposed to gathering data. It's important to try to gather the accurate information. Uh, that's why an exit interview is uh, is an, an important thing. We brought up exit interviews a few times, and we talked about exit interviews. That's where you go in and you say, okay, you've already quit. You've got You've got you've not got no bridges to burn here. You're gone. You and, and wait 30 days, and so that the you know all of the edge is off of that of quitting, and go back to that employee and sit down with them and have lunch with them. If it was a key employee, and say, oh, talk to me. I'm listening. What are what was the good? What was the bad? What really was going on? What's the truth about how it felt from your seat in working in our company? What were the beautiful things and what were the terrible? And, and we all have them, we all, and, we, and they're blind spots. And so by getting that information from employees in a meaningful way, that's really important for us to do. Uh, balance of nature's approach on that isn't necessarily to get the truth, it's to reinforce the lie. And, and I, I, don't, I, I don't say that as an attack against balance of nature. This is the same human psychology of when you ask someone to write you a letter of reference. You're reinforcing the lie. And I'm, 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 kinda, I'm kinda saying that really just halfway. What happens when you leave a job is that magically you're not there anymore, and so you become an easy person to blame for everything that's wrong, that they get discovered over the next 30, 60 days while you're gone, after you're gone. And so over time, you may become a scapegoat for a lot of other people that are just throwing you under the bus because it doesn't matter, you quit already anyway. You don't work there. So now, when I need a reference from this person that, uh, that who said, you know, if you need a reference, I'd be happy to give you a reference. We worked together for 10 years. And, and that, but, but they said that before they heard that 60 days worth of stuff that you got blamed for that you didn't do. And if I've written a letter right when I quit, and they gave me the letter, 
the chances are they've reinforced their true belief set, and the chances are they're not going to change their mind if they get checked for references afterwards, even after I've been blamed for stuff that I didn't do. So that's a human psychology weirdness, right? Uh, and so it's in your best interest if you leave a place and have friends there that say they give you a reference, have them give it to you now. Have them write it down and give you a sheet, uh, date it if they want, um, and uh, uh, but you have it in your hand. And the value of having it in your hand is when you do need it, you don't have to go ask for it again. Uh, but the real value is that they're not going to go back on what they wrote. If they said you were good, they're not going to say otherwise uh, because they think you may have given that letter to somebody else and they don't want to look like an idiot by saying two different things, if that makes sense. So this, the smile sheet does the same thing for the employees. It burns the thing that this morning I was happy. I said so. I put it down on a survey. So I must be happy. <laughs> you know, it just you're 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 further burning a, a mindset, and, and which is not a bad thing to do. I'm not saying that's a bad thing to do at all. Uh, be sure that we're giving reality to though, that we're not just coercing people to to say oh it's great, but you know it's the emperor is naked kind of thing that you know got no clothes on, you don't tell the boss they don't have any clothes on, you just don't do that. Uh, that's a bad idea, so you just you say good things or you say nothing. And, and that, that's dysfunctionality in an organization. We want to try to get to the bottom of what really is going on so we can retain those employees. Because if there's, if there's crap going on, we need to know about it. So we can address it, so we can do something about it. So maybe we can, and our objective is not to go in with a, sw a, a cut a swath with a machete and fire a bunch of people. Our objective is to try to make the place a better place. And if we can coach and, and help people. We have an awful lot of people that are supervisors and it's their first time supervisor. And that's like giving a cop a badge on day one of work. Uh, and, and you've been an officer before. That feeling of getting dressed the day you're gonna go report to the job for the first time. You've, you've been trained, you've got out of of post training, you've gone through the academy or whatever it is that you've gone, you've got this training, you've got a uniform, you have a badge, and you strap on a gun and a taser, and you look in the mirror before you leave. And that's a feeling you've never had before. And some people don't know what to do with that power. Right? I mean, we've, we've seen people that, that biff it. You know, all of a sudden they're Mr. Real Cool, you know, because they got, they got a badge and a gun, and they don't know when and how to use that properly. It should be trained, but we're all humans, and you know, first time we get authority, we don't know how to handle it ourselves, and so we mess it up uh, a lot of times. It may not be a badge and a gun in our case, it may just be a title on a business card. And, and, and now we don't even know how to act or behave on that, and so we do it wrong. And the organization needs to help me do it right. You know, they need to, to reach out to me and coach me and help me not make the mistakes of being a first time guy with some authority, because that'll drive employees off, and we want to retain them objective here. Uh, okay. Did we cover your number okay? All right. We're at number five. Why and current programs aren't improving. Hang, hang on a second. We didn't cover your cal, uh, 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 cal okay. Hang on just a second. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Go, to page, go to page six and you'll see the key drivers of employee engagement they find are purpose, development, a caring manager, ongoing conversation, and a focus on strengths. That's from my perspective as an employee. I need to feel purpose. I need to feel that I'm being developed, that, I'm, that the company is helping to develop me, my boss cares about me, that we're having dialogue, not just once in a while when I'm in trouble, but we're having co a constructive dialogue, and there is a constant conversation about what I'm good at and what I'm really not going to out of the park in, and they're building up my confidence in the things I'm doing well. And, and that is an important piece that Callie reports to us in uh, uh, section uh, four, now section five. Now, Andrew. All right. Why current programs aren't improving employee engagement? Um, it's not my job. It's HR's job. Yep. They should be down here talking to you about this stuff. I'm busy. Um, or we're using the wrong matrix uh, to measure. Either we're getting too complicated or we are 
uh, setting the bar way too low for the smile sheets. Um, or in our case, we don't have one. We don't have one in place. We don't. We don't have any kind of yeah. employee engagement program. It's just us on the floor talking to people, uh, making sure that everything is going okay. Um, so yeah, we don't use surveys. I wish we did. I wish we did not see. I did too. <laughs> I did as well. Survey um, monkey. <laughs> well, it would be nice to know. You know what I mean. Yeah. Um, it would be nice to hound out, hand out a survey on a random day um, and get some honest feedback. You know, am I doing a good job? I recently gave a survey to, to, to Larry and I'm still waiting for it. Um, and I told him, look, you just be honest. Give me honest feedback, that's what I'm looking for. How can I do better for you? And I would like to do that for the regular people on the shop floor. It's a powerful thing, and, and sure. it's super valuable to do, and it is um, uh, a, a requirement to build a high level of trust before you, that's ever going to work. Uh, I have to know it's not a trap. Right. I have to know for sure that I'm not about to get the mouse cap from tapping down on me. Uh, yeah, we did, a, we did surveys. This was probably like 20 years ago, and it was supposed to be anonymous, and somehow it ended up not being anonymous. And <laughs> We had some foremen and supervisors that were not mature enough to handle the information they got, and I really think that they were not good to the employees after that. There were certain ones that were felt like they were targeted because of their answers on the surveys that they tried to be honest because they thought it was anonymous. But I mean, each person I think had a number assigned to them, and then the foreman knew who did each survey, so that wasn't good at all. That was a long time ago. <laughs> I remember. We haven't done it again. Phil wants to return. I remember a company very much like yours. Uh, might have been a company you bought. Uh, and, and I remember a survey that was done at that company. And uh, I was interested in the answers. And I went in, they had a meeting set. I went into the meeting, and the meeting before me in the in the conference room, it was a training room, uh, was uh, uh, they sat around in a circle with all these anonymous surveys out on the table, trying to analyze handwriting and pen oh, colors. Right. And it was like I came in and I I almost lost it. I go, "Are you kidding me? Wow, that's we just learned everything we need to learn about the problem here, yeah. uh, and, and and let's talk about what you're doing." You know, and you know, do you think I'm the only one that knows? Everybody else that filled one of those out was afraid you'd do exactly this, and 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 they were, honestly, they were. Uh, but uh, Nord doesn't work there. Who? I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> you had a chance. <laughs> That's dysfunctionality. The tool is fabulous. And we want the information out of it. And sometimes if we're not sure that the information is, um, that we'll get it in the form of a survey, I, I wouldn't be opposed to say, uh, have breakfast, lunch, or a break with one-on-ones. And, and have your list prepared and say, look, I really want to know some stuff about what we're doing here culture-wise and what would make your job easier and what are the things that make you afraid the most about this company. You know, you love your job, you hate your job, whatever it is, you want to keep your job. And, and uh, I want you to love your job and I, I want us to do the things necessary for you to love your job and, and I value your point of view. And so having a one-on-one -on -one conversation that's not in writing and not recorded you let them know this is not a recorded conversation and live to it and say, this is the two of us wanting to know stuff. I've wanted, just think about it as a customer, I've wanted managers of restaurants to sit down at my table for a minute and ask me a few questions about the meal I just got. You know, what was the service like? What was the menu like? You know, I've stared at menus, you have too. I've gone into restaurants, I've stared at menus and didn't see one thing on the menu that I wanted to order. 
it was like, this is all too weird, you know? <laughs> or I've gone into other places and I've just had a hard time deciding, because there's 10 things I'd like to order on there. That looks good, that looks good, that looks delicious. And so how, that's magic. How does a restaurant do that? And am I just one? Yes, I'm just one. But get that information with more than just one. How many people are looking at your menu and not being able to figure out what they really want to order? And would your business go up if you changed your menu? You know, Chili's, Outback Steakhouse, Olive Garden are always thinking with their menus. Even McDonald's throws a McRib in and takes it out. You know, they're messing with their menu. Why are they doing that? To, to learn, keep learning if the tastes of the customers are changing. And you do that by one-on-one -on -one conversations, sitting down. Surveys are okay, but where I really would get information is sitting down looking at somebody in the eye and saying, you know, what about the noise level in here? Is it too noisy or is it not noisy enough? And understanding that's just one person's opinion, but it's one more opinion than I had before I asked the question. And, and so learning that one person's opinion as a customer is of value, learning the employee's opinion is more value. All right, we're going to need a break here pretty soon, so let's get through this and have to hear from Gallup a little bit. Josie, the 12 ele elements of which you only have one, right? I, I found two more online, uh, but it only left me two. Okay, I got all 12, so we're going to cover all 12 before we're done. <laughs> but go ahead and introduce uh, what you learned about the 12 questions. So it's about measuring employee engagement and like the tools that you can give your employees to make sure that they have like more opportunities to feel more engaged. And We'll work more on it together uh, going back through the 12. Uh, let's go to number seven, the model that you see. Yes, yeah, so the employee engagement model has uh, four tiers. So it's basic individual teamwork and growth. And it basically talks about how uh, each uh, level is not a checkbox. If we go, well, we got basic done, so now we move on to the next one, to the next one, to the next one. Uh, you have to consistently and continually fill these needs and move on to the next one. And if you try and move on to the next one before, you're going to have some issues. Okay. So it's understanding the elements. And of the 12 questions, they fit at different spots on this pyramid. Yeah. And yeah. the other handout that you gave us last time. It has, has that in there. It, ha it does. Yeah. It has those listed in there. Uh, number eight, the three types of employees you have, one of which you know is. Yeah. Okay. Okay. They have engaged and they said that's 33% employees, and that 33% of the employees are engaged, and um, they have not engaged. It says there's 51% of employees. And so the engaged ones, they said, are people that will like go above and beyond, maybe stay late to get a project done or whatever. They're excited about their jobs. Then the not engaged employees are just the ones that clock in, get their job done, and leave as soon as they can and just do their job just to get the check. <laughs> and then actively disengaged, which are 16%, are people that show up and they're just like uh, very unhappy and complain and uh, you know make the morale even worse there because they're so unhappy, but they don't leave. Yeah. This is an important thing that, that uh, Joelle's talking about here. Uh, and and when, we, when, we, when we look at this room, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, Ten of us in this room, what she just told us is that 30% in this room, that's six of us. Six of us on this team are engaged. You're all in. You're doing, uh, that's not 30% of 10. <laughs> Holy smokes, am I in accounting or what? <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me there. Uh, three of us are actively engaged. Three of us are on board, and, and about a third. So, so, so three of us in this room are on board. 50%, 51 or something percent, you said, of our workforce is not engaged. They're not, they're, they're really on the fence. They're not against us, but they're the ones that are doing, the engaged are doing their job and more. You know, whatever it takes is what the engaged people do. The, the, not engaged people will do the bare minimum tonight to get fired. 
you know, so they're not going to stay a minute late. They're not going to show up a minute early. Uh, they will, if they're entitled to whatever it is, they'll take the full entitlement. You know, they're, they're trying not to get fired. That's good. So that's five of us in this room that were like that. And then the actively disengaged are two of you. And you're vocal. You're, it's us and them. Why don't they do this and that? And you talk to the five that are neutral, that are sitting on the fence. You're, the engaged people aren't listening to you because it's like, leave me alone. I got to do my work. I got my job to do. The unengaged, the, the neutral people, the five of you, are sitting ducks. You're, 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 you're a target of the two that are trying to get somebody to join them. And active disengagement means that they will, at some point, do something detrimental to the company. They will ship a product that's wrong. They know it's wrong, and they'll ship it wrong. And, and, and they may do it out of defiance, they may do it out of their way of accounting the, the unfairness and making it fair. Um, it's just part of their active disengagement. Sometimes they will tear up your machine. They know it needs the bearing needs replaced, they'll run it anyway. And watch it get hot and blow up the motor. And, and you've seen that happen on the, on, in, 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 in a plant setting where a disengaged, I saw an actively disengaged employee uh, at a textile mill, take a two by six and throw it into a weaving machine, a six million dollar machine, and wreck it. Uh, and they did, did that out of anger when a girl had been promoted to his boss, and he didn't like that at all. Uh, she hadn't been there as many years as he had, and she was female, and this was a plant in Mississippi. And uh, he was a redneck by his admission and his own uh, definition. And he took that board and threw it in the machine and walked out of the place after wrecking it. That's active disengagement. That's doing some, that's, that's a crime. He committed a, a, a vandalism crime against the company uh, and didn't care. And actively disengaged, get to that point. But here's the, here's the interesting thing. When we look at a, at a team of 10 people, these numbers are the general reflection that Gallup has found in our teams. We can beat that. The Super Bowl winning team doesn't have two actively disengaged players out of there. They, they've sorted them out. Uh, and by the way, actively disengaged are not the ones we want to fire at first because they're the ones that are talking to other people. And that means they're willing to talk. They're the people that are here trying to change something. And they're talking to people about that thing that they want to change and it's made them real mad. And it may be a little thing from the corporate that may be why they haven't got their way. They have to park in the back parking lot and they want to park near it's a public parking in their store. Why shouldn't I park in a close spot? And the manager says, employees park in the back and it makes them mad. And so they start talking to everybody about that and they become actively disengaged because of where they park. And, and uh, so I want to try to win that employee. We try to identify. And I'm trying to win that employee because if we can get that person, they won't go through the uh, unengaged. They will go direct to engage. Once they get, if they get converted, they're all in just as loud as they were against us. They will be for us if we can switch them. If we can't, we need them out of the organization. Because right? they're poison, the cancers to the organization. So we want to move them out if we can't get them switched. But, um, this is an interesting number, and I've gone into boards of directors of companies that you know, uh, at two, two organizations that you knew know that you don't know the term. The players that were players when I did this, this was some years back, but I went into the UTA, the Utah Transit Authority Board of Directors, uh, and exposed exactly what we just talked about here. Uh, three out of 10 were engaged, five out of 10 didn't give a rip, and two of them were trying to tear up the organization. And, and I went into IHC and their corporate board in Salt Lake and found the same thing. People that were appointed to the IHC's board of directors just because they owned a bank and it was prestige for to, have, to serve on a board and they didn't really care about the organization. Uh, 
they just liked the credential of being on the board and they weren't trying to help the organization and a few of them were trying to actually hurt the organization uh, we found out because of conflict of interest and so having this kind of engagement disengagement happens at every level in the organization and it can even happen in a family uh, there can be actively disengaged people in the family ran company here in town just about got torn apart because of it and and uh, uh, that's private information mostly to them there's public pieces of that but within a family a mother and a father and two children and their spouses and uh, we almost saw a company fall apart because of that they get torn apart not fall apart they get torn apart and that's not okay for the company, it's not okay for the family, it's not okay for the organization, uh, for the community. And so it's all the same thing. Why they're disengaged is different reasons for everybody, but it's our job to try to pull the team together. And uh, if we want to retain employees, we need to fix these problems and work on them and work, work through them. Number nine. What's the difference between employee engagement and the employee experience? Experience is even before you show up to the company, the experience in, in all around versus engagement where you would you know, during during the time. When they list a couple things here on, they say that uh, employee engagement, uh, most organ organizations will try to make employee engagement a central part of their, their value of, of hiring somebody from the actual hiring is, like, did we hire the right guy for the job? Do they feel like that they're doing the job that they want to do, that they're the best at, and they enjoy doing, and uh, just get the difference of that. Um, they were able to say, do our, do our managers and their teams have regular discussions about the engagement of their team members and how we create an engaging culture? That one, I think, is lost on a lot of people. And, it's just, and that's where that us versus them come in. Because yeah. most people that get hired see maybe one person, one of the supervisors, maybe, maybe the HR, and then they go to work. They, don't even know who the plant manager is, don't know who the, ma the other supervisor is, don't know who the, their, their manager is. They just do, not even, most of them don't even know what, do, what they're doing. So the, the engagement, that, that question, I, I, li I like that question a lot, because in fact, uh, when we did that strategic management class, I went in there and asked a few people in that company I used to work at, um, do you know what your job description is? That's, it's a simple question. It's like, uh, well, I got hired to do this. I'm like, so, so what's your job description? Oh, we'll make ice cream. Like, well, that's everybody's job description. In fact, maintenance is job description too. Yeah. Well, what's your job description? Nobody can really tell. And so I told the, the guy, and actually, it's cool, I actually got hired with him. The, the main plant uh, supervisor now, we got hired at the same time, so we became pretty good friends. But I told him, well, there you go. Most of these guys don't even know what they're supposed to do. Yeah. And he just kind of like, oh, I don't understand. Pretty know, much not fair, is yeah. it? It's, yeah. it's completely lost. There's how no how can you do a great job when you don't really know for sure what's expected? I mean, you would think everybody would know. And if you've got a company, make sure everybody does know. You know, it's not hard to, to find this. And bosses sometimes are hesitant to find it because then they think people aren't going to do what's not on their job description. Well, that would be kind of fair, wouldn't it? <laughs> if they, you know, change your job description if you find you left something out that's important for them to do or if something changed so that uh, you have now have something new that you need them to do. One, one of the things I was gonna add to that, um, the one that where, where it says, are we hiring for to fit a role so that people do what they do best every day? Um, a lot of that, 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 I think that's where I went down here, is as, as a basic mechanic, when I first started there, they said your job is to fix machines. Cool, I, I, I grow, I was learning, I did what I did, what I did. Then they said, hey, we're promoting to lead, and it just went. Because I'm like, what does a lead do? I have no idea what it does. What am I supposed to do? I lost all my jobs to getting to everybody else. And then I was just the babysitter, I guess. I don't know. Like, I, I totally did not know what I was supposed to do after that. Yep. And I saw these jobs that, that, that we talked about me doing, they got them. So I just started going. That was cool, I'm glad they did it. Cool, I'll help him out and I'll stand there and say, if you need anything, let me know. And then I'd look him going, well, why didn't, you know, why didn't I give you a job? Why, why don't you guys give, give me stuff? In fact, I went to them and said, give me some jobs to do, I'm bored. I'm not gonna show up anymore, I hate this place. 
And it was not that I didn't like the place. I loved the place. I really did. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the work. But it just, because of, of faulty communication, lack of engagement, I started falling, being like, okay, I'm done. And this is one of the things we talked about uh, quite often in this course. We talked about how, from a le leadership point of view, clarity, being clear to everybody about everything is really one of the most important things we can deliver. Now, the employee experience and employee engagement was the title of that, that little part there. And so look at it this way for a second. The employee experience is what I get as an employee. This is what, this is the trip that I make as I go through my career, my job, my day. Uh, that's the employee experience. The employee engagement is what I get. And, and, and we need to have both. The employee needs to get stuff and the employee needs to give stuff. And in a functional organization, if, if we get those things in balance, people get it. They don't have to wring it out of them. People voluntarily, I mean, you look at some of the things you've done for your company, the way you've gone the extra mile. I bet every one of you could list me 10, 15 things that you could remember in the recent past that you did, nobody made you do them. You just saw them to do, uh, you went through, you did them, got them done, and, and, and that's engagement, that's stuff you do. And when a boss sees that happening, then the employee experience ought to go up, right? Uh, the, 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 the balance of things you give to the employee uh, ought to give, go up because the stuff they're giving to the company is going up, yes? I feel like a problem with probably a lot of these companies are that they started out kind of like our company did. My dad was the person that started it and they ran the office with like five people. And he, they, he knew exactly what everybody did and then they had a shop with a foreman and maybe 20 people. But then it exploded and now we have an office with like 12 or 15 people and then a shop at our facility has, well we have a total of 70 employees there and a 70 at the other place. They don't know who's doing what anymore, and the top three guys are just scrambling, trying to keep work going through there, and projects, and sell, you know, um, projects running, and they're so overwhelmed with just that. They they for, they just don't have a handle on what's happening, yeah. you know, and it's just a real struggle. So like, even though our HR guy left, and they handed a lot of it to me, and a couple pieces to other people. They don't even know. Like, I am doing the insurance renewals. I'm getting bids on the new packages that are coming due in January. But, like, we're in operations meeting, and our general manager's like, who's HR now? And I'm just sitting there like, this was like a week ago. They really don't even know who's doing what. And it's just, I don't know. I just feel like it's a lot way in a lot of companies when they grow. They, they're, you've got a few people that are key trying to keep jobs running through and flow, and they have lost everything else. This is, this is something to tuck into the back of your head uh, because it's not intuitive. When a company is growing, everything's pell-mell. You've got a backlog. You've got more than you can get done. It seems like life is good. Comment? And you made a decision to divorce. Well, there are a whole lot of other reasons. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and and that this is kind of exactly a, a case of what we're talking about. It, it 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 really it really is. One of the things that's not intuitive uh, is that managing growth is very very much harder 
than managing a turnaround. When a company is going down, everybody knows at, within the organization. Everybody is afraid. Everybody is focused. Every, you can have frank conversations with everybody because everybody's trying to save the company. It's going down in flames. You're trying to get the flames put out. You're trying to get the brakes put on. You're trying to turn the organization around. And it can be done. Uh, I've been hired in that circumstance a number of times. Bank is afraid of they're losing their money, and they'll bring somebody in from the outside to see if you can try to help them and 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 put the brakes on. But it's easy in that scenario to get everybody's attention and to have a conversation about controlling costs and and you know um, you know getting optimization uh, out of everything. Everybody's on the same page. You're trying to save the company, but when you're in growth, nobody knows what to do. It's just growing so fast that. It becomes unclear what I need to do, and it's hard to get everybody's focus. And everybody thinks money is no longer an object because you're you're growing. You've got obviously we got we're rolling in the dough. The market's all great, whatever it is. Watch out. <laughs> uh, that's that's much harder to manage than a turnaround. And I'd rather much rather work for a company that's growing than in a turnaround. I hate those scenarios when you don't know if you're going to make payroll or not. Uh, but uh, you do have everybody's attention when that, that's the case. And so, anyway, that's just a side note. Uh, it's, got, it's time for break. We're going to take a break. We're going to come back and we're going to hear a few short clips from Gallup directly about these, these 12 questions that Josie uh, shared with us. And we'll have a little wrap-up conversation about that, and then we'll switch topics. So take a break. We'll see you back in a few. Yeah, I could see it now. I could watch that. Uh, so 
So, so the thing to do is maybe you're the tech guy too. Uh, I'm running this off of this simple little thing. <laughs> I think that we, like I say, I think that we've done it enough to zoom. Uh, I don't think this is active. And, 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 uh, I, I kind of got mad at you telling me that in this case, we'll call the shots and get it to get the shots. So that's what I think of that. That's what it's all about.
HVAC guy's getting a tour of our air handler over there. It's yeah, interesting. Uh, part of the building. We got a boiler up there and all that stuff. We're gonna we're gonna watch uh, Gallup, one of the PhDs that's in charge of research at Gallup, give some comments about the Gallup 12 questions, and these are 45 second videos. Uh, for maybe a minute video, something like that. Uh, one for each question. These are the 12 questions that Gallup has decided from their research. These are the 12 things that indicate employee engagement the most. Now we've looked at these in other classes. Uh, this is a bit of a review. If you want to gauge how well you are doing as a boss, uh, giving your employees the Gallup Q12 survey and have them uh, answer those questions, uh, and then uh, have, do it again after you've had, had a chance to look at them and work for three months on them or something like that. This will give you a gauge on a scorecard for you, a report card for you of how you're doing. And, and uh, that most of the questions are answerable. They're not debatable questions. They're, have you, they're black and white answers. Have you, you answered yes or no, no. You know, do you have the tools you need to do your job? That's a yes or no. Uh, if the answer is you're missing stuff, then it's a no. You don't have the tools you need to do your job. Uh, so that's uh, uh, this. If, if I have an employee a question, I know what is expected of me at work, which is the first question that Josie uh, shared with us, and I say I don't know what's expected of me at work, you can't argue with me. <coughs> I don't know. And I'm not placing blame about why I don't know. Maybe I don't know because I'm dumb as a rock and you told me and I didn't remember any of it. So you obviously didn't teach me what I need to do at work. So I don't know. Uh, and so it's not like uh, uh, this is terms for an argument. It's, it's, it's a message to me as a boss of where I need to work, what I need to do to close the gap so that my employees that report to me can answer yes for all 12 questions. That's basically the goal is to answer yes for all 12 questions. And if you can't, it's my job as a boss to figure out how I can give you uh, the information or the connection or what I need to change in my game plan so you can't answer yes. So the first question that we'll look at, we'll look at all 12 of these uh, quickly. basic but overlooked um, engagement element out there um, and it might seem real basic and that most people would say I strongly agree to that only a little over half the people in the world that we've studied strongly agree to that statement so it's overlooked and it's it's foundational if you don't get that one right then you can have great relationships you have people connected to the mission of the company you can have best friends at work but it doesn't get applied in a way that's directed toward helping the organization improve so that role clarity is really important Expected of me at work. That's quite. That's Q1. Q2. I have the materials and equipment I need to do my work right. Basic materials and equipment. We found out it's, it's highly emotional. That embedded in, in us is a sense of loss aversion. If we have something, it's taken away. It hurts more than, than the joy of getting it in the first place. And so people need the stuff. Uh, to do their jobs. And a lot of times it's just fine-tuning. 
um, it's all related to doing your work right, but it's fine tuning uh, for someone on the front line in a, in a retail environment. It might be you know, literally just having a stapler to staple some receipts together. Uh, a lot of times when we get under the hood, we find out that it's, it's real basic things that aren't all that costly. Shame on us if our people say no to that one. At work, I have the opportunity to do what I do best every day. Question three. This one's really centered in, uh, in, in not only who you hire and making sure you get the right talents aligned with the right jobs, but also positioning people when they're in their role to, uh, to do their jobs most effectively based on their natural talents and strengths. So two people in the same role may do the job a little differently depending on who they are as an individual. So that's the day-to-day -day management. Um, there's some extreme language in that one and that's, that's the everyday part is important because it, it helps the, the question uh, differentiate between highly productive and less productive environments. Now they know that we have to do some stuff that we don't do best as well, but the idea is do I, am I mostly able to do every day stuff that I like to do. In the last seven days, I have received recognition of praise. That is an indictment. Every time we, uh, we uh, do something that we view as, as a positive outcome, we get kind of a surge of dopamine. That's the same with recognition. And the last seven days is important because um, we can get recognition, but we need it continuously. If, if it's conditioned on doing great work, um, doing, doing our work right and doing great work. And so if we're, if we're productive and we're doing our work, it's, it's very difficult to get too much recognition. Now, the thing that a lot of managers kind of overlook there is that different people need recognition in different kinds of ways and so we're all different we're all individuals and some of the hard work of management is getting to know each person and making sure the recognition is right for the person and that it's based in good work and that it's frequent that's continuous question five my supervisor or someone at work cares about me as a person This one relates to a lot of, uh, almost every outcome that we look at uh, in our research, uh, that you have someone in your work environment that really cares about you. Now the, the best scenario is that, that it's your manager first, that your manager or your supervisor um, that you feel cares about you is looking out for your own best interest. Um, so we all have situations throughout the day where uh, we might need to take care, care of something that's not work related. or. Um, we, we might need someone that we can just download with and share something with. Um, a critical kind of foundational element in, in the workplace in terms of engaging employees is that you have someone you trust that you can go to that you feel is really uh, interested in, uh, in you uh, for yourself and not just for the outcomes of the organization. My supervisor or someone at work seems Six, there's someone at work who encourages my development. It takes it a bit further about thinking about each individual's future and their development. And one of the most important elements that we ask about is that, that there's someone who's thinking about where you're headed in the organization and is, is kind of getting uh, people done through work, um, as Don Clifton used to say. And uh, uh, really uh, really important um, part of, uh, of what goes into engaging employees and it's uh, it's one of those those elements that uh, you've got to have the right managers in place to be able to get it done right There's someone at work who encourages my development and remember you said it's best on both of those last two if it's your boss not somebody else at work my opinion seems to count This is one of the more difficult of the, of, the, uh, of the 12 elements, one of the more difficult to get a strongly agree response to. It seems like it's just about listening to people, right? Well, it's a bit more than that. It's, it's uh, listening to people in the context of how uh, the work they're expected to do is getting done and how 
the organization expects them to do their jobs. And so um, we found that when people know what's expected of them and their opinions count, the opinions are even more relevant. And to get people's opinions that are really close to the action, close to the customers, is essential. A lot of times that gets overlooked and things get kind of just handed down in the organization. But uh, listening to people close to the action brings some clarity, it brings some uh, new information that helps, uh, helps uh, managers and leaders make better business decisions. Mission or purpose of my company? Some people in some industries start, they join organizations because they feel they get really excited about the mission or purpose of the organization. We found that one becomes even more relevant though if you have some of those first more foundational elements in place uh, because then, then the mission takes on a new dynamic where they can actually um, actualize on their mission or purpose. Now, kind of embedded in that one, is uh, another element of human nature around just wanting to be a part of a tribe. Uh, we all have a need inherently to be a part of some tribe. Now for many of us it might be a sports team, it might be uh, a church, it, or a religious organization, or it might be a club of some type. But why not the organization? In fact we found the most uh, dynamic organizations have a sense of, of tribalism where people feel they're a part of something bigger than themselves. And, uh, and so that's, that's another critical element, and it taps into a pretty important aspect of human nature. The mission or purpose of my organization makes me feel that my job is important. You know, early on in our research, we used to ask the question, are you committed to doing quality work? And you might think about the kind of answers we got. Well, we got a lot of strongly agree and agree responses. People, most people will say, yeah, I'm committed to doing quality work. But when you ask people about their fellow coworkers, then the answers tend to change a little bit. They, they, uh, you get a really wide distribution of response, and it actually means something more. Um, it's a statement of how much you trust the people that you're working with. And uh, when people can say that their coworkers are committed to quality work, that's a really positive statement about the culture in the organization because it means uh, the people I'm next to are really doing their work right. I have a best friend at work. This is the one that I argue with the most. And we may have talked about that in a different class, but we may talk about it again. Another element of human nature that's uh, uh, just essential is the social part. Um, when we come to work, we don't stop being social beings. We're still social, we have those needs. Uh, but if you ask people directly, do you have friends at work or do you have good social relationships? Because there's a sense of social desirability in all of us, we're gonna say, yeah, people like me. But you add that word best on top of it and it makes it more di discriminating or differentiating. It, it, it separates out really those strong, high trust relationships from the ones that are less so. And uh, some people will say, well, I could never give a five to that because my best friend is from high school or something or grade school, fine. But uh, still more, uh, more positive responses to that question are better. And uh, it says, again, something pretty uh, dynamic about the culture. When you think about uh, people who might say they have a best friend at work, but let's say that they don't really know what's expected of them or they don't feel they have someone at work who encourages their development. You can kind of think about what kind of culture that is. It's, it's a gripe session, right? People going to work, they've got a strong social relationship, they're gonna complain about the office and complain about what's going on. But on the other hand, if they have a best friend at work and those other more basic elements are in place, so you can kind of see how this is all really contextual. Um, they have those other elements in place, it becomes a very innovative, informal discussion that's really about how we can get better in this organization and, and a pretty critical element to innovation. I mean, we need someone who we can trust to share, um, to share big ideas with, um, that are just going to listen and, and kind of play off of that and give us good, strong feedback about it. And uh, so there's a lot, of, a lot of parts to why that question is important. Um, but the, the baseline in, uh, importance of it is really around uh, our need for social relationships, even when we come to the office. So they build a case for why we need a best friend at work. And uh, that case, I, I now believe, is strong uh, in, in, in my travels being uh, 
arguing with it in my head, and I didn't think it mattered that much, and I think I've changed my mind completely to, to agree with what they're saying there, that having a best friend at work, uh, we don't quit the best friend, we don't let a best friend down. We may let the company down, but we don't want to let our friend down. And so that's an engagement hook in, in a way, and it's important to the company, uh, it's important to the friend, and it's important to us, our, our insight. In the last six months, has someone talked to me about my progress? We've had several opportunities to go out and study really highly productive managers in all different parts of the world and, and, and ask their employees what they uh, what they do on a regular basis. And, um, you know, um, one of the, uh, the managers uh, himself told me that if I ever get to the performance appraisal time and uh, my employees are surprised by what I tell them, I know I'm not doing my job as a manager. So that, that word progress is really important because we, we all need a regular time throughout the year where we can check in and know where we're, not only where we're at, which with great managers, the employee already kind of knows where they're at, but also to think about their progress and the future and where they're headed in the organization and to use it more as a de developmental discussion. And so we all need that time to check in and then the more regular we can make it, but the more we can move it beyond just a formal performance appraisal to more about how each person can develop and grow. And the last one, in this last year I've had opportunities at work to learn and to grow. Yes or no? And learn and grow is continuous. Uh, some people uh, might believe that, you know, when I get to a certain tenure in the organization or um, or I become an executive that, you know, learning and growing is less important it's all about delegating. We found just the opposite. that. Uh, it's a basic human need that never goes away. And it's also very specific to the individual, where they see their, their development going in the organization, where they see their career going. And so uh, learning and growing is very unique to each person and where they want to head. And so the more the managers can kind of get close to um, what each person's intentions are with regard to their career and provide them opportunities that not only help them learn and grow within their job, but personally as well. Those things don't have to be mutually exclusive. All right, that's the Gallup Q12. I gave you a handout earlier that had all 12 questions on it and a scorecard in a way that you could give that, uh, if that, that question, that survey, to employees that you work with or that work for you, or you could gang up on your boss and do it about the boss if you wanted to do that, uh, and just get a score. And it's not a score that you want to publish. It's a score that you want to look at because it's a scoreboard of you. If you give it to people that are on your team, it's a scoreboard of what, how you are doing. And what you want to do is move the needle in a few months, give them the same uh, survey, and you want to see how it, uh, how it adds up. Here's a three minute, three minute uh, summary, sort of, uh, from Dan Goldman uh, on the Gallup uh, engagement. For several years, the Gallup organization has been doing surveys of employees, and they've consistently found, and reported again this year, that only about 30% of employees in a given company are fully engaged in what they're doing. That means that companies aren't getting their best out of people, and that people aren't enjoying what they're doing. We've known about this in psychology for many, many years. It's called the Yerkes-Dodson Law, and it's like a bell curve for IQ. Uh, with the optimal performance at the top of that curve. On one side, you have people who are under-engaged, who are bored. These are the people who are you know, doing Facebook, video games, who have that button on their computer that lets them push it when the boss is coming. Looks like they're working, but they're not. The other people, though, are overstressed. These are people who have too much to do, too little time, too little support. Neither of those groups, and they're very large groups, are at their best. The remedy for this is not just finding the best leaders or finding the best people. The remedy is learning to continuously improve how leaders lead, how managers manage, and how people do their work. And the good news is that we can continue to improve through life. The brain is continuously adding new neurons. The brain is what's called plastic. It can change at any point. 
And this is very good news because other data shows that leadership means first leading to manage yourself, your internal state, and that determines how you lead other people, whether you can inspire them, whether you can motivate them, whether you can listen, whether you can communicate. And leaders who can do that are the ones who get people engaged, who raise that bar from 30% to 40% or even higher uh, for their team, for the people they touch. We know from research at Yale that leaders who are in a very upbeat, positive state, who themselves are engaged, make people on their team engaged, and those teams perform better. Leaders who are not engaged, who are downbeat, who are sour, create that in the people they lead, and their performance goes down. So given that, given the fact that we know there's a direct relationship between a leader's own state and engagement and those of the people on their team, we need to help leaders get better at being engaged themselves. And the good news is that this can be learned. We have data from Case Western Reserve showing that these abilities, which by the way are the essence of emotional intelligence, can be taught and learned to people in mid-career at any point in, in a working life. And we also find that when people improve on something like being able to inspire, being able to listen and empathize, being able to manage their own emotions, their distressing emotions, and stay in that upbeat, engaged state, that when people learn that, going back and asking the people who work with them as much as seven years later, we find that there's leadership. This kind of leadership improvement stays with them. So remember, there's no need to kill the dream of improving at any point in your career. And that's what happens when you think, well, there's no point in people trying to change or improve. We'll just find people who are like that already. Instead, we should be thinking about how to help people get better and better as leaders so that they can keep people engaged in what they're doing. The thing about engagement keeps coming up. I want to switch topics because we're talking about organizational effective, effectiveness and engagement is, is uh, certainly a part of that. Uh, I want to go to one of the other handouts that you have and I want us to, to talk about it uh, because this is, as we look at, at organizational effectiveness, uh, this becomes really the old name of the game. And the sheet that I want you to look at is this single sheet. It's blank on the back. It says profit model works here. I want to talk us through what I call the profit model. And if you look closely on the bottom, uh, I copyrighted this in 1997. So I've been teaching this for a long time. Uh, and, and, uh, and I've been taking companies through this idea because our, 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 the purpose of our organization is we want to increase our profits. We don't just want to make a profit, we want to make more profit. And that's probably pure raw capitalism, but it's not an evil thing in our culture. You know, we, we, we're okay with making a profit uh, because that's how the company pays us. That's how the company buys us a new computer, uh, buys new equipment. That's how the company grows, and that's how the company becomes more stable over time, is by growth, the growth in becoming more profitable. So our real objective in the company is to increase profits. So we can draw that with a dollar sign, but the reality is there are only two things we can do to increase profits. And it doesn't matter what your company is doing. If it's a service, writing computer code, installing uh, wall beds, or uh, providing entertainment and a rodeo. Whatever the product is that your company is doing, uh, there's only two things you can do to increase the profits. One, you can lower your cost, costs. And two, you can increase your revenue. That's it. Uh, you know, we, we think there's all kinds of gymnastics that we can go through to increase our profits, but this is really it. We can lower our cost, and then when, when we lower our cost, every dime that we lower in cost is one more dime of profit. Just the way accounting works. 
And, and so lowering our cost has an immediate impact on the bottom line, the profits of the company. Increasing revenues has an indirect impact on the bottom line because we have to, all of the expenses that we go through to build the product. You gotta pay my labor. You gotta pay for the materials. We gotta pay for stuff. And so it, every dollar of increased revenue is not a dollar of increased profit, right? It's only a, an increase of whatever your margin is. And if you're Walmart, the margin's 4%. So $1 increase in, prof, in revenue gives them four cents in profit increase, but it's an increase, right? So every dollar saved in operating costs is one more dollar in profit. That's a direct impact. So these are the two things we can do. This is the one that I like to do, but you have to be careful. Uh, if, if lowering costs becomes our focus, at some point you have to tell to everybody, we should fire everybody because we'll save a lot of money in labor. That's true, but you now can no longer produce, right? So it's, it's, there's a point at which we lower costs to our detriment, right? We, you can always make a gallon of ice cream cheaper, one of the original ice cream makers in America said, but you may not at some point in time want to eat my ice cream if I keep making it cheaper and cheaper. It's not gonna, it's not gonna taste as good as a more expensive ice cream does. So lowering cost isn't the only option, uh, but it's certainly one option we do. So with that as a foundation, the driver that increases revenues is always satisfied customers. Our business is dependent on satisfied customers. Growth is dependent on satisfied customers. We need those five-star Google and Yelp ratings. People look at them. We need happy customers in order to increase our uh, revenues. And we need the organization to have its act together in order to lower our costs. We have to be smooth in working together uh, in order to drive costs down. This is called, in the, in the Toyota world, this is driving out waste. This is looking for Muda in lean manufacturing, lean production. It's don't handle the materials three times. Move the machines close together so we reduce transfer costs. Uh, and so we, it's, it's getting your act together organizationally that allows us to lower our costs. Interestingly enough, when the organization has its act together, that also drives customer satisfaction because you got your act together. And so by, by doing things right the first time, customers are more happy. So that's the model. How do we do this? What do we need to look at? What do we need to focus on in order to do it? Uh, let's start with increasing our revenues. And, and there's a few things that we can do to increase revenues. Uh, the first and foremost that I always teach and talk about with small companies especially, let's do the guerrilla marketing. The, uh, the American colonies won a war with guerrilla warfare against England, right? We, we understood guerrilla, that hide in the trees and don't wear the bright red coats in a line and you know, do stuff like that that is sneaky or free. Guerrilla marketing YouTube started out with a guerrilla marketing campaign, little round stickers that they sent to everybody that posted a video up. They said, put this sticker somewhere, not in your room. Put it on a lamppost, put it on a street sign, put it on your car. And, and what happened was YouTube built their presence from giving away decals and said YouTube.com. Because when you spell YouTube, it doesn't always come out the right way, right? There's letter U or the word U or, you know, there's a lot of ways of doing it. So YouTube spread that around and sold their company for $165 billion. Billion. With a guerrilla marketing campaign that made them, uh, made them the household work, right? And, and what, what we see with guerrilla marketing, it's stuff like 
you know, do the things that don't cost you lots of money that give you uh, market presence. And there's tricks and trades, uh, and tricks and, and, and tips of how to do that. Every industry has some, and if we were, this was a marketing class, we'd spend a bunch of time on what are guerrilla marketing techniques. There's books on guerrilla marketing, uh, but guerrilla marketing might be having something like uh, Voodoo Gunworks here in town, uh, makes precision rifles for competition shooting. Uh, they make the gun for the Olympics event where you ski and squat down and shoot and, and hold your breath and all that, and those guns are very accurate rifles, uh, precision rifles they're called, and, and they have a couple of employees that's burned their Saturdays and Sundays doing nothing but, but combing the gun forums and answering questions and, and, and talking about their brand and the problems that they've solved, and the public loves it because these are experts that are helping them shoot better and giving them tips and tricks and, 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 and that costs the company a few dollars to pay an employee to spend their Saturday online looking at the forums for competition shooting. Every industry has that kind of stuff. Haven't you? And that's gorilla, right? That's a lot cheaper than buying a Super Bowl ad at $4 million for 15 seconds, right? That's a whole lot cheaper than age-old marketing where you've got a big hole and you shove all kinds of money in it hoping that it gets you a return. Guerrilla marketing is something that we would talk about in a different class about how to increase revenues. But more practically, you've got a bucket that has all your customers in it and there's a hole in the bucket. You lose customers every day. Uh, they fall through the hole in the bucket. We do it because we don't ever act together. So we got to figure out how to plug the hole. We've talked about employee retention. The company has to also be aware of customer retention. How do we retain customers? And some of you have accidentally signed up on a web page for something that you ordered, and they are peppering you with text messages and things you can't refuse. Uh, mm -hmm. An example of one that has an amazing campaign is wish.com. And if you haven't been tangled up in them yet, uh, it's a matter of time till you will be. They have a profound customer retention program. If you make a mistake of buying one thing, you will buy something else sooner or later. They'll figure out something that will attract your attention and you'll do it. That's brilliant. Uh, that's plugging the hole in the bucket because how many times do you buy something from someone one time and you never buy? That's, you fell out of their bucket. And what did they do to come get you? What did they do to keep you from falling out? What did they do to plug the hole, the reason that you left? And for a local business, you know, it's even that much more critical. Online, it's easy to be anonymous. It's easy to uh, fall out of somebody's bucket. It's easy to lose a customer. But, on, but in, in, if you're in face-to-face in -face business, which many of you are, um, we can't afford to have people falling out of the bucket. So understanding that the customers that are in our bucket need to stay in our bucket, that's a conversation we can have with every employee in the organization. We've got a bucket with our customers in it. Everybody can visualize that. Everybody can understand it. We want to keep every customer in the bucket. And if you piss them off, they're going to fall out of the bucket. Don't let that happen. So that we can work on the hole in the bucket. We can go out and find new customers. We call that increasing market share. But in, in, in dollars, this is cheap, this is cheap, this is expensive. Going and finding new customers. And in online terms, they call that the acquisition cost of a new customer. Every business needs to know what that is. And if I were talking to you about sales management or marketing in this class, we would be talking about the acquisition cost of a new customer. What does it cost you to get one? And if you're in the structural steel business, the acquisition cost of a new customer is, is extraordinarily high. If you are Jimmy John's Pizza, it's a lot lower. It's still a cost, but it's a lot lower cost per new customer. And you, you know, there's a, there, there are ways that you calculate this in, in marketing terms, but it's expensive to get new customers one way you get more customers in your bucket is to buy a competitor. 
s and Steel's bucket got bigger when they bought St. George Steel. But that was expensive. And it probably continues to be expensive. That's an ongoing thing that the cost of, of customers in the bucket um, is something that we have to look at and manage and we have to know. Um, finally, and this is you know, this is coming back down in, in uh, cost a little bit, is what I call the marketing bucket viscosity. That's the thickness of the customers in your bucket. How much is one customer worth to you in your business? If I am Stuart Onnings and I, I, I buy a, uh, or I sell a, 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 uh, an awning structure to a customer and, and, and uh, uh, that's a sale, this says sell more to each customer. So the idea that I want shade over my patio, I've been sold on that concept. I call up and I, I get a shade over my patio. But in their brilliance, they say, you know what? You know, this can be automated, <laughs> right? It can, it can be, you know, open sky when you want open sky. And we can automate it so that it knows when the sun's on it or it knows when rain's on it. It knows, it knows it's a smart awning. It, it costs more than the, than, but I'm selling more to the customer. This goes back to McDonald's if you want a biggie size. And they don't do that anymore because biggie size meant this and they got sued for that. But the idea, do you want to upsize small the, your order? If a customer has already ordered the sale sandwich, fries, and a drink, that's a small fry and a small drink, right? Uh, that is on this, this, the $4 sandwich. Do you want to upsize that? That'll be the first question. They've already got your order. You're already in their bucket. You're in the drive-through. You have given them your order. They have you. So now, what else can we sell to you? And in that case, you just make it bigger, and now all of a sudden, you know, they increase their sale with their two most profitable items, a drink and fries, right? And so uh, th these are the high margin things that they added to the set. We're attuned to this, right? We, we get, some of, sometimes we get sick of being upsold. You know, we bought that car, and now they want a rust proof, and you go, really? This is St. George. There ain't no rust here. That's one of the problems. We got no rain, you know? And so I don't need to pay to rust proof my new car, but, I, but, but you need your scotch guard, right? And you know, whatever it is. So these upsells, we get kind of, you know, we get kind of, you know, put off to the upsell, but still from a company perspective, this is what we want to do. And in the automotive industry, an example would be a few years ago, a five-year lease on a new truck was an appropriate lease. Uh, that became a four-year lease. How come? Because you buy more often. It became a three-year lease. How come? Because you buy more often. It became a two-year lease. How come? Because you buy more often. So that entire lease portfolio that you were flipping once every five years, you're now flipping once every year or two years because you get shorter and shorter leases. That's an instrument that they put us into to get more per customer. And maybe it's a favor to you, but it's a, it's a scheme on their part, right? That's what it is. And so if you can put the scheme together on yours without offending the customer, because sometimes it's a favor. I really want to know this little minimal thing that I bought you know, on Amazon, it's what others bought when they bought this, and you get three things to add to your 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 cart, right? And and sometimes that's a favor because you go, oh yeah, I forgot, I'm going to need a gasket for this thing, you know? And they throw in the install kit and the tool and the gasket because other people bought it, and that does me a favor. But what they did is this: they increased their revenues. So um, none of that is going to happen though without happy customers. Are they going to stay in the bucket if they're pissed off? No. Are, they, are, is it, are we going to go get new customers if our old customers are all mad? Probably not. It's harder, right? And, and are they going to buy more if they're upset about the stuff they did buy? The answer is no. They're not going to come back again. They're not, and, and so, you know, uh, transaction frequency is one of the things that fits in this. And so if you're a restaurant, for example, the problem with the Cliffside restaurant when it was called... Rococo's, thank you, uh, the Sullivan's. And it, the problem with that was it was the nice place in town uh, with the view, and that's where you took somebody on their birthday. 
So you don't go next week because that's the birthday place. And if you've reserved it in your brain for the birthday place, they get your business once a year. And does a restaurant want your business once a year? No, they want it every week or every couple weeks or every third week. They want you to go to that place more often. That's why we get customer loyalty cards, to get us to go back to that brand more often. And, and we, we do business with them more frequently. That's why Domino's uh, burned themselves into the computer chips on your laptop last time you ordered a pizza. Now next time it's one click and you get exactly the same one you ordered last time. It's fast and easy, and why go fight with uh, Hungry Howie's when Domino's is just going to be one click. I don't like the pizza as much, but it's easier to order, and so we can do that, right? And we get more frequency because of that. Send me a text, Jimmy Johns. Text the neck out of it. If you gave me your phone number once upon a time, you got 20% this week, and you got a sandwich thing waiting for you if you get ordered two. You know, you've got some campaign going on. Why? Because they want me to get a sandwich at lunch at least once a week at one of the Jimmy John's, right? Why not? I'm gonna eat lunch, right? Why not have it at Jimmy John? And why not get me in the habit of going there same day every week? And and if they can do that, that does this. And they're only gonna do that though if it's you know sub Sebastian Freak <laughs> or whatever their, <laughs> their campaign is that they're doing. And so we have to have satisfied customers. Um, how do we get Satisfied customers are happy customers. We're back to the customer satisfaction driver. Uh, there are certain things that we do uh, that make for happy customers. Four drivers that I've identified. There may be more, uh, and 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 but but there's these four for sure. What do you have to have if you're going to have a happy customer? What's one of those drivers? I'm, I'm looking for quality product. What did you say? Trust. I, I have to have trust in what they're doing. There's an, there's an agreement there that they're going to deliver what they say. But what I'm looking for is, is, is quality. I, I have to have quality. If I, if, if I don't get quality, I'm not happy. If it's not what I expected. And quality, by the way, is for me to define. You know, when I'm looking, I'm a customer. It's for me to define what is quality stuff that matters and stuff that doesn't matter. The price value relationship has to fit. There are $500 trucks for sale in St. George right now. And there are $150,000 trucks for sale, probably more expensive than that, but I know for sure $150,000 trucks for sale in St. George right now. Somebody will buy the $150,000 truck and somebody will buy the $500 truck and most of us will buy one somewhere in between, uh, maybe a lot closer to the 500 one than, than, than the other. But anyway, we work out the, it doesn't have to be, this doesn't say we have to be cheap. It says the relationship between price and value. There are people that do buy Lamborghinis and there's something in that structure that makes an $850,000 car work for their lifestyle. It's not needed to get the groceries because it doesn't fit very many. But something in the price-value relationship allows them to pull the trigger on that sale. And that's true of every item. And some people actually won't pull the trigger unless it is the most expensive one. Something in their head says it's no good unless it's the best one. I want to get the best one. And, and places where that can really shine is Stuart Audience. You go to a house and you look at what they put in the kitchen and the counters and the floors and so forth and the kind of windows that they bought, they didn't put Home Depot windows in that $3 million house. They're not going to want a cheap awning. They're going to want the value of the awning to reflect what they believe their house is. So they're going to be okay with an expensive one because they're going to want it to match and go with the house. And, and, and they're fine with that. But it better be good. It better not blow down with the wind. It better be, there. those are two of the drivers. We also need service. If I order everything the way I wanted to order, and I gotta wait, 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 wait. Doesn't matter if the Big Mac was perfect and the French fries were just right. If it took 17 minutes to get them. And the, the person behind the cash register couldn't run the cash register, and they were on their cell phone talking to their girlfriend. And they didn't even 
acknowledge me for a while. That blew the whole deal. You bought the best beef, you bought, you, you, you priced it right, you, you made it right, but the service didn't back it up. And so this will wreck the customer satisfaction. And finally, there's one more, and I'm gonna let you guess what that is. What is that? Probably has, I hope it's not a bad word, but it, 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 on time delivery is what I'm looking for. So if, if when we had supply chain problems, it, it bothered us all, right? Because you'd order something and we expected toilet paper to be in stock, you know? We didn't think we were gonna have to, you know, contract to the plant to have it made by the truck. But we didn't think. So on time delivery has to be within our expectation. It's part of service, but I separated enough because you can get good service in lousy delivery. And if I order a wall bed and we're three months out, I streamed that. It's still really bad. My husband sells appliances over at uh, Carpets Plus. It's a year to get a Wolf or a Sub-Zero appliance, still. And Bosch is so far out on their dishwashers, they said don't even have anyone order one. It's that bad. Wow. It's really bad. Like, with appliances, because a lot of the parts are done in China. Or the control boards are. Yeah, good. they're not getting done. And yeah. the chips, computer chips, are just not available. Let's start appliance business. We need appliance repair people really bad. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting, actually. I think they just want me to throw it away and buy a new one. I don't think they want me to repair it at all. If but you when you buy a wolf, wolf, you have to. I mean, it's too expensive, right? Yeah. yeah. Or whatever, maybe. So, yeah. zero stuff. so these are the four drivers that have to happen for customer satisfaction. Yes, ma'am? I was just going to say with the appliance thing, um, a lot of like I'm in charge of home warranties at Mr. Planet where I work now, and they stopped making a lot of the parts, or I don't know which brands yet. Not it's like anything. Samsung and LG and those. They just yeah. don't even make the parts. They just don't make the parts and anymore. So and so when I put in a request for the home warranty, one of the questions is, can you order parts, or do we need to order parts? And it's like, no one can order parts. No one makes them anymore. You have to replace just the parts because you're. They're disposable for like three, four years. If they're built in Korea, those are really, they look really nice. They have lots of nice features, but the inside parts, if you see what they are, they're crap. Crazy. <laughs> we, that whole world has changed. Uh, Kenmore used to be the number one plants brand in the United States. And how do you mess that up? You know, we're gonna look at a video on organizational effectiveness on Nokia. Nokia owned the cell phone market. How do you how do you do that? You know what do you, what do you what do you do? What do you, how do you do that? And and, and that's not organization. That's the opposite of organizational effective. So these are the things that we have to do to have satisfied customers. But honestly, there's not too many things, and they're not too many things that don't make sense. They all make sense to us, and we can explain that to everybody in our organization. These are the things we have to do, and if we can't currently deliver within reasonable expectations, it's not fair for us to say, well, let's just change the public's expectations. That's not okay. Uh, that's a marketing problem. We've watched General Motors make mistake after mistake as they've lost their entire market share in some segments to Korea. And, and, and we've, you know, how did Hyundai and Kia do that? How did they take GM's business away from us? But we, we look at a micro example, um, three years wait to get a Z06 Corvette, what's wrong with that picture? Somebody needs to fix that. Uh, why are they selling for $50,000 over sticker price? Why isn't General Motors making that money? Why are they pricing them, you know, why are they only gonna make 500 of them? Why, you know, they made 40,000 regular Corvettes last year. Uh, why are they gonna make 500 Z06s which will be double the price? Why, why, why? I know, like you know, in appliances, I don't know if it's the same <laughs> thing in the. Um, well, I don't know if it's the same thing in the car industry, but in the appliance industry, when COVID hit, they had to redo all of their assembly lines because they had to get the distance between the people, and so they were only employing like half the people because they couldn't fit. They had to redo the way they manufactured everything, and I don't think they've undone it. No, they have GM not. Did. GM shipped a lot of vehicles without chips. 
with the, it, with yeah. the possibility of it being there. We'll get them later. Here, uh, here's the vehicle. Here, take take, part, lots take part of your eighty thousand dollar truck. I'll give the rest of it to you. Just get, to get it. But, it, but it'll be two years old by that time, and uh, you may not even want the truck. We got a mess going on here. That's part well, we can't even make formula here. It just sucks. But is it producing satisfied customers? The answer is no, it's not. So we're seeing disruptive force in the marketplace because we're not happy with what we're hearing, what we're going. Those aren't reasonable. The second part, real quick, sorry about that. Yeah, go ahead. The second part right now is everybody uses what's well, happening to everybody. It's not my problem. Yeah. We can't get it either. So me, the little guy, is like, so what? Well, sorry, we don't care. But basically, that, the service is, is way down because most of the people that are on the phone talking to the customers have no clue what's going on. Yeah. And we just can't get it. Why? I don't know. Well, those of you that are conspiracy theorists, we're at it again. <laughs> I, I, I got a notification yesterday that uh, the CDC has uh, actually, uh, the FDA through the uh, HHS released a statement that monkeypox is eligible for emergency use authorization, which means that companies can then come in with monkeypox tests and uh, treatments without FDA, like we did with COVID. And so it's like, what are we doing? Are we opening up a whole nother wave with a whole nother virus that may or may not be a real virus? I don't know. But we responded to it. We're in the process, my side job, we're in the process of of, of responding to that, coming up with an emergency use uh, test because we don't have to go through normal processes. To, so I don't know. Anyway, uh, let's get finished because I want to. I want to get done in time. Uh, organizational effectiveness is got three drivers to it, in my opinion, and maybe you can justify more. Uh, but just like uh, customer satisfaction has four drivers. There are certain key things that produce satisfied customers. There are certain key areas that produce an organization that has its act together. And those things, if we want to look at them closely, uh, the three categories, there's a technical component. That's how well does this organization uh, manage its processes and systems and its flows. And, and by flows there, I mean how does material flow, how does labor flow, how does finished product flow, how does cash flow? So all of the things that need to flow in an organization, if, if the organization has its act together, these things flow well. If the organization does not have its act together, these things get clogged up. Our processes don't support things the way we want. We have a behavioral component of the organization. This is how well do we talk to ourselves? How well does one department communicate with another? How well do the teams work and what is the overall culture of the company? Do we have a fabulous place to work or a nightmare going on? And, and so how does the company behave? Does that make it more effective or does it make it less effective because we're, we're, we're putting out fires because we have people fighting? Or we have uh, different departments against each other pushing each other and we're not behaving very well. And then the leadership component throughout the organization, but starting at the ownership, how well are they aligned, pulling for the same thing? How much are we, do we know about the goals? How well are we planning the strategies of what we're doing and how we're doing it, and how disciplined are we at doing it? So do we put collection procedures in place and then go, ah, he's a friend, he'll pay eventually, and all of a sudden he's, you know, he's aged out six months and they're not paying the bill, and, and now we have a cash flow problem because we're not disciplined in our credit policy. And, and so the leadership allowed that. And so the organization becomes less effective just because of exceptions that we're doing in any one of these three areas of the organization. Does that make sense? So if we want to fix the company, uh, this gives us some places to look. And we can pass that around to the management team and we can say, hey, you know, um, I guess I put some slide things in there uh, for that. Uh, we can say, hey, we can, we can work on doing these things. If we have these things together, we can, we can start to do a better job of uh, increasing our revenues and lowering our costs. The amazing thing is there's one more hidden driver in that uh, that we would want to draw. And if we have the organization has its act together and we are talking to customers that are delighted 
the hidden driver is employee satisfaction. I just blew that up again, just so it's big enough to see it. Not a hidden driver. So if, if we have our act together here, and we have great customers here that are happy, then employees are happier. And when employees are happier, Bill Walton said, you know, Sam Walton, uh, Bill's a kid. Sam said, um, you know, we, we, if we take care of our employees, the employees will take care of our customers. And that was a true philosophy for once upon a time in, in, at Walmart. Uh, it may not be the policy right now that Sam's gone. But, uh, but we can see that when you've got employees that are disgruntled, we're not capable of, of, of being our best and doing what we need to do. So organizational effectiveness doesn't happen when employees are dissatisfied. <laughs> and even if you've got a third of your employees that are dissatisfied or 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 fifty percent that are just on the fence, we're not doing our best here. Because if you notice, I drew all of these as gears. What happens in a gear chain when one gear breaks? It all stops. The whole thing stops. So if I've got a problem here with leadership or I've got a problem here with quality, this entire thing stops turning. I stop producing effect, uh, happy customers. I stop being effective as an organization. I stop lowering our costs. I stop increasing our revenue. We're, we're, we're in trouble at that point. We could talk more about this, uh, but I think for right now that's, that's a model. You've, you've, you've taken some notes. My suggestion is to take this handout. And I want to talk about a little bit more next class about some pieces in this handout about the how to manage like a pro. And I want to talk about some elements that are in there. But if you look at this, uh, this handout, the very first page is a page that you've already worked through a little bit. You've done a SWOT analysis. You've turned it into me. I've given you credit for a SWOT analysis. Going back to the SWOT analysis for your company, there are things that you would have listed in these squares as your strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And then you could say, if we want to get better, what should we stop doing that's making us weak? You know, we on, on our strengths, if we start doing, stop doing stuff, we'll be stronger. Like for me, on my strengths, if I stop eating pizza, I'll be in better shape, right? I'll, I'll be stronger, right? And then I, my health will be better. So I could, there's a stop doing list our company could do for each of these things that we've identified in our SWOT analysis. And then there's a start doing list as well. Uh, if we want to improve, uh, minimize a risk or improve a strength on our SWOT analysis, what should we start doing that would respond to what we listed there? So you can start with what you already did in your SWOT analysis and put that in here and then think through with your team about stuff that you ought to stop doing as a company. You know, let's stop staining a certain color because we have problems every time we do that. Uh, let's stop it. You know, or, or let's stop uh, installing, uh, you know, posts in, 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 in rock, you know, and houses that are on, that you got to do, you know, you got you to gotta get a demo team out and blow something up to pour concrete in there. Let's stop doing that. We lose money every time we do it. Let's just not do that. Let's find a different way to do that. Let's stop building houses on blue clay. You know, all of Green Springs is blue clay. The contractors that build there know how to put in helical piers, put a solid foundation, and have a house sitting on bedrock that's 30 feet, 40 feet down, and they don't pour regular foundations. Almost every house in Green Springs is built that way. But if you bid on a job to go build over there, you better either learn how to do that, or you're going to lose money. And so stop taking jobs when there's blue clay problems if you don't know how to do that. Uh, and, 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 you know, st stuff like that you can put on it. Then we're going to talk about the middle pages later. But going to the last page, you see the profit model analysis. And we have on there the, 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 the features, the things we talked about, the things that, are, that show up here on this model. You know, and, and, and we've identified things like transaction size. How do we get bigger transaction sizes on what we sell? I'm just in production, I'm just in the factory, but what could we do that would increase transaction size? Once upon a time, Wilding said, hey, let's supply the mattress with the wall bed. 
We don't make mattresses, but why not supply it? Why make the customer go find one? Let's deliver it ready to sleep in. We add some money and profit to put a mattress in there. That's the kind of thing that we can do to increase transaction size, right? So every one of us could talk about stuff like that. What if we stopped just sandblasting beams and we painted every one in a cool color? Would customers pay for that? If they would, that would increase transaction size. If they won't, don't do it, right? <laughs> but, but talk about that. How do we get them to buy more often? How do we go find new customers using guerrilla techniques? Have this conversation with your management team because this matters to everybody. This isn't just the job of the owners or the sales department or the marketing department. It's everybody's job. So have these conversations and that last page kind of guides you through some of that. Uh, at least gives you the items to, to look at and talk about from the bottom. So, that leaves us just a few minutes. I want us to look at organizational effectiveness in terms of what if your organization isn't being as effective as it ought to be. Uh, and, and let's talk about causes uh, or, or consequences of that a little bit. Um, got, I've got an 11, I've got a couple to talk about. Nokia. Uh, let's look at Pizza Hut for a second. See what you think about Pizza Hut. Uh, and uh, uh, Denver's not here, so we can we can decide what we think about. Thinking about organizational effectiveness. Pizza Hut is what I would consider an iconic American brand. Thinking back, they're kind of like the perfect family restaurant. Honestly, how many of you watching this have these great memories of eating there with your family? Maybe you had your birthday party there, or maybe you participated in their Book It reading program where you earned one of those colorful pins, or my favorite, a personal pan pizza. It would sure take a lot to get that pizza, but it was on another level. I'm sure that many of us have similar memories involving Pizza Hut, which is why it's upsetting to see them like this. Now, to be clear, I'm not saying that they are in any immediate danger of shutting down, Pizza Hut is still pretty stable and I'm guessing that they are going to be with us for quite a while. But I do have strong evidence to suggest that Pizza Hut has seen better days. In 2019, they announced that they would be closing 500 of their 7,500 US locations over the next two years. It's part of their long-term plan that involves closing underperforming restaurants and replacing them. I'll touch more on it later, but for the time being, that is a significant downsizing. In fact, the president of the company, along with other top executives have expressed that they haven't been happy with Pizza Hut's overall performance. Looking at their sales over the past few years, they have actually been fairly consistent, which may not seem like much of an issue, but it is concerning. See, when we compare that to Domino's, I think we start to see the problem. When they say that no one out pizzas the Hut, I don't exactly know what that means, but it might not be true anymore. In the 1970s, and even well into the 1980s, anyone who was around at the time can tell you that Pizza Hut used to be the national pizza chain. They were a national pizza chain before there were national pizza chains. People had to make the choice of either going to the local regional place or to Pizza Hut. Any other popular chain that you can think of today was not a factor on a national scale until at least the 1980s. Then, over those next few decades, things got more competitive. Some of those smaller chains started closing the gap, but Pizza Hut still remained on top. That is, until 2018. As we saw in the graph, Domino's took over that number one spot and over the next few years have only extended that lead. That's meaningful. After 47 years, the world's number one pizza chain, Pizza Hut, has fallen to second place, and a distant second at that. In that same year, 2018, I actually asked the audience of this channel, what is your favorite of the big four pizza chains? And after 46,000 votes, Domino's was the clear winner over the second place, Pizza Hut. I believe further suggesting that people have moved away from them. More evidence would be the fact that their biggest franchisor, NPC International, filed for bankruptcy in July of 2020. They were the ones who operated about 20% of the U.S. Pizza Hut locations. Of course, there were some other factors involved in that one, but it's not a good indicator of the state of the brand. Plus, it later led to an additional 300 restaurant closings. And then finally, what about the logo change? Through most of their dominance years throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, this was their logo. Then, in 1999, they changed it. They added more colors and slanted everything. But then, 20 years later, in 2019, they went back to that old logo. According to their chief brand officer at the time, embracing our 
iconic Pizza Hut logo is recognition of a time period where Pizza Hut unequivocally reigns supreme because that's where the future is headed. I take that to mean that the old logo represents a better time for Pizza Hut and that bringing it back will remind the customers of those better times. I hope that we can at least agree that Pizza Hut has indeed seen better times. They've lost a lot of control of their market and in this video I'm going to attempt to explain why. The very first Pizza Hut opened in Wichita, Kansas in 1958 and it could not have been more modest in the beginning. It was two brothers named Frank and Dan Carney. They borrowed $600 from their mom and used it to buy used equipment and rent out a small building not too far from a university. I thought it was interesting that they called their first restaurant Pizza Hut mostly because they obtained this sign that had only enough room for so many letters. And you know, of course they wanted to use the word pizza, so that meant that their second word it can only be three letters. They eventually settled on the word hut, and that was the beginning of the brand. If they had a bigger sign, things may have gone much differently. Early on, they valued quality pizza, good service, and believed in it so much that on their opening night, they gave away their pizzas to try to attract a customer base. It was an effective promotion, the restaurant did well, and after about a year, they were able to convince a friend of theirs to operate the first franchise location in Topeka, Kansas. It's also worth mentioning that part of their marketing early on involved this, I guess, stereotypical mascot named Pizza Pete. I believe that it was meant to double as a fun cartoon for the kids while promoting the Italian authenticity of their food. The pizza itself wasn't nearly as well known or popular at the time, so something like that was effective in drawing in customers and creating a fun environment. They adopted that red roof logo, started designing their restaurants in the same manner, and continued franchising more and more locations across the United States and even into other countries like Canada and Germany, and by 1971, Pizza Hut had over 1,000 locations, making them the biggest chain of pizza restaurants in the world. Six years later, when they had more than doubled to over 2,000 locations, they were bought by PepsiCo, and it was Pepsi that was able to take them to an even higher level, surpassing 5,000 locations in less than a decade after the acquisition, and surpassing 7,500 locations when they spun it off, along with the rest of the restaurant division, into its own company that was owned by the public. If you want more details about their time with Pepsi and what was happening with all of that, I do recommend this other video that I made about Pepsi, but that new company that it was now a part of was initially called Tricon Global Restaurants, but soon renamed it to Yum Brands, which is how they exist today. Right now, it consists mainly of KFC, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell, though some people have expressed the opinion that Pizza Hut has been the one holding them back and should be divested. Now, when looking at the reasons behind the trouble happening at Pizza Hut, I think most of it can be explained by two main issues. The first one being a lack of catchy menu items, and I realize that this might sound so trivial when you first hear it, but let me explain. Today, seemingly every fast food restaurant has a never-ending sequence of new items that are pumpkin-flavored or Cheeto-flavored or whatever, but Pizza Hut was somewhat of a pioneer at this, to a point where I would even say that these catchy, innovative menu items were once a major part of their success. A couple of examples of what I would consider to be more gimmicky ones would be the edge, with toppings way closer to the edge of the pizza than they should be, or the Big New Yorker, both introduced in the late 1990s. They sold pretty well and kept people coming back to Pizza Hut, but then there's other examples of new menu items that they introduced that I would truly call innovative. Some examples there would be in 1980 when they came out with the pan pizza, or in 1995 when they came out with the stuffed crust pizza, famously promoted by Donald Trump. There are countless examples to show how Pizza Hut once had one of the most creative menus out there, which unfortunately may not be the case anymore. In late 2014, you may be surprised to hear this, but Pizza Hut announced an all-new menu. They called it Flavor of Now and described it as their biggest brand evolution ever. I mean, this was meant to be a big deal. They had new ingredients, new sauces, new crust flavors, new drizzles. Just a bold attempt to completely revamp their entire menu to make it appear fresh and more upper scale. And to go along with that new menu, they updated their website, the boxes, the uniforms, the logo. I think that the goal of this was to shift their customer base away from families, and more specifically toward millennials. I'm gonna go ahead and guess that most of you barely remember this happening, or maybe not at all, because the whole flavor of now attempt was pretty much a failure. As we've already seen, it did nothing at all to help their sales. If anything, they actually went down a tiny bit the following year. The CEO of Yum Brands confirmed that the results were disappointing, and as far as I could tell, it's mostly been abandoned. If anything, it probably just alienated their <laughs> existing customers more than anything else. Overall, this suggests to me that Pizza Hut is not quite what they used to be in introducing new menu items that appeal to their customers. I'm just saying that the Bigfoot pizza was a little more successful than the cock-a-doodle bacon. 
So weird sentence. The second part of their troubles, I believe, it can be attributed to being slow to delivery. And I don't mean taking over 30 minutes to deliver a pizza so then it's too cold. I mean taking too long to make pizza delivery, in general, a major part of their business. Here's what I mean. Historically, pizza is like the most common thing to have delivered, right? I mean, now more than ever, but it's been happening for a while. Before 2020, before online shopping, before any of it, people were having pizzas delivered. However, Pizza Hut was once famous for their family-friendly sit-down restaurants. In the beginning of this video, when you were thinking back to those memories of birthday parties and personal pan pizzas, which is another Pizza Hut innovation, by the way, they took place inside of a Pizza Hut, not at home eating pizza delivered by Pizza Hut. It was like an event. It was an outing. It was not just about the food. In fact, they didn't even offer pizza delivery at a large scale until 1986, and the only reason they did it then was because Domino's had been so successful with it. You might even say that Pizza Hut's lack of delivery during those times is a big reason that Domino's was even able to get their foot in the door in the first place. I do have to say that after a late start, they have been aggressive with it, but I think the issue is that it's such a fundamental change as far as the public's perception. They've had all of these crazy marketing attempts to try to make people associate Pizza Hut with delivery. In 1989, they famously delivered pizza to the White House. In 2001, they delivered it into outer space. In 2016, they delivered it onto Mount Kilimanjaro. When they closed those 500 locations, the reason for it was to eliminate the dining area and to reopen them as smaller buildings. Their fastest growing store models are the smaller ones that they call Delco, short for delivery and carry out. And part of their reasoning is that if every time you see a Pizza Hut, it's a little tiny building, you're going to reconfigure your mind and associate them with delivery. So to summarize all of this, Pizza Hut is a very different place than it used to be. They've been around for long enough to have the world change around them. Parts of what made them popular before are no longer relevant, and they've been forced to adapt to those changes. Whereas some of their competitors, like Domino's or Little Caesars, first grew in that new environment, if that makes any sense. It's kind of like Pizza Hut is the older generation struggling to fit in with the new one. Some of their attempts to do it do seem to be a little slower, potentially misguided, but they are attempts. They know where they need to go, but they just don't know exactly how to get there, which gives me confidence that they will eventually make progress in the right direction. Let me know in the comments, what do you think about Pizza Hut? How have they changed over the years, and how has your perception of them changed? Do you even like their pizzas, or do you prefer one of their competitors? I do want to re-ask that poll from 2018 to see if we get different results, so be sure to check the community tab of this channel if you want to weigh in on it or check the results. That should be fun, and any other thoughts you have about Pizza Hut or any other part of the pizza industry, leave them in the comments. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Thank you for watching. Well, we're nearly out of time, but we'll just talk about that for a minute or two. Uh, there are four former Pizza Hut locations in St. George that I know of. Uh, one's about to reopen as an uh, Asian restaurant on, uh, by Jimmy John's on Bluff Street. It's open. It's, it's open? How's, how is it? So anyway, uh, we're getting a new one in Hurricane, which was weird. I, I noticed it today at Pizza Hut. Okay, yeah. uh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think about Pizza Hut? Is is he what was he right about? What was he wrong about? Organizational effectiveness. It's not all marketing. It was having their act together as an organization as well. What do you think? And we we are we are customers. We we are entitled to our opinions. I think Domino's does a really good job with their uh, web applications and stuff. I mean. Thing yeah. and all that stuff. So I think they really capitalize on the cell phones and all that jazz. And I don't even know if Pizza Hut has an app. I think they should go back to the old thing. You get it every Sunday. They're five and then mix and match and everything. So I'm like, <laughs> yeah, it's super easy. You just did. Yeah. yeah. You just yeah, ordered Pizza Hut like, since I've been in St. George for like yeah. four years. So. Well, wow, that's it. That's very interesting, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I don't ever remember dessert options from Pizza Hut. And that's a way when we talk about extending a sale, right? Right. Why not get the cinnamon thing or whatever, you know? 
kids love it, and it adds another ten bucks to your order, or whatever. The lava cakes. The lava cakes, yeah. They're, they're you know. Right? Yeah. I don't know. I used to eat at Pizza Hut all the time. I used to stop at that Pizza Hut mm -hmm. on my way home from work, grab right. a stuffed crust pizza, right? But I think that once the uh, patent on that ended, done. Now everybody's done. Yeah. Stuffed crust made it. Yeah. 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 Me yeah. growing up in the '90s, I loved it. It's great. So, so the interesting news there, I think, is that if our organization isn't staying on top of things and the effectiveness, we'll lose it. You know, and and they haven't lost it, but in this market they have. If you look at total dollars sold in Washington County, uh, Pizza Hut's not at number one, and uh, Denver could give us more information about who is we. And you know, how do we know that? By the way, how do we know what sales are in in pizza in St. George? Every company has to pay tax. Sales tax data is public information. So if you are thinking of opening a food truck, find the names of the other ones. See what they paid in sales tax. Now, they may lie, uh, but that's go to jail lie. You shouldn't. And, and so uh, finding what your competition is paying in sales tax is an interesting tool for some businesses. It's not for every business, but for some pizza, for sure it's. You can know exactly what their sales volume is. You can drive by the restaurant, count the cars, how many employees they got there. I mean, you can, you can learn a lot about your competition from Google Earth. Uh, it's a satellite a picture of their parking lot. I can know how many cars are parked at Wilding every day from Google Earth, right? You know, like, it's not accurate, but it's a nice indicator. It tells me that it's not 200. It's an old, uh, it's an old photo. It, it's an old photo, yeah. <laughs> and it is an old photo, it for is, real. Because yeah. you got your buildings are touching now. So, you know, they're, it's just white. bigger. Yeah, they're bigger, okay. So anyway, um, organizational effectiveness is a key to uh, our, our business, and HR has an impact on how effective our organization is. Senior management has the biggest impact. We all have a play. Uh, so with that, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about it next class. We're out of time today. Uh, NFL started, so maybe you catch the last quarter of the game, and uh, we'll see you on uh, Tuesday. Thanks.